give all of the glory for the meeting tonight and our presence as friends, brothers, and sisters in the Lord Jesus. We give high praise to God, and we do that in our worship that we offer to Him, the songs that we sing, the prayers that are uttered, and our concentration and dedication to the sacred writings, God's Word, the perfect message that God has given in the Old Covenant through the Holy Spirit, through the prophets, and those who taught what God's Word says about fidelity to the Lord, trusting Him, following Him, believing and knowing that in Him is forgiveness, mercy, goodness, love, and an eternal home with Him when human history one day comes to an end, and it is going to end. Our life on earth is going to stop, and we will know life in eternity, and we focus on what is yet to come. We concentrate, we think through the sacred writings allowing the Word of God to lead us along the way. In the New Covenant, <clears throat> we read about God through the Holy Spirit guiding the apostles. They were the agents of Christ, the ambassadors that Jesus sent out into the world to proclaim the sacred message of divine truth. And the apostles were men who did not know compromise. Paul, Peter, James, John, and others stood the ground that God dictated and taught them. They did not flee from Satan. They did not flee from human beings who taught false doctrine. They stood the ground. They remained loyal to God. And they were able to endure until the last breath from their body was taken. There is one who went astray. And he went to his own place. His name was Judas. And his own place is not a place of joy and happiness. He gave the Lord over to the enemy. Judas, a betrayer. And now he is well aware that his actions were opposite to what God said. And he is going to undergo punishment until the resurrection morning. And then he and all others who have defied God and rejected God's way will go into the punishment, into the realm of torment. And it will be beyond human comprehension as we have it now. And the reality of it will indeed show that those who turned away from God or those who rejected Him must now pay that penalty that God has prescribed in the New Covenant. Therefore, we choose God's way above every other way. Jesus said, every plant that my heavenly Father did not plant will be uprooted. It will be snatched up by the root. That is so true, just the way the Lord spoke it. And may God's will remain within our hearts and lives, the way that we pursue, the way that we follow, because we want to be with God the Father, with Christ the Lamb of God, and with the Holy Spirit in eternity. We want to be where Moses is going to be. We want to be where Paul will be, where all of the holy angels are. And just to think, that if we will obey the gospel, the good news of salvation in Christ, and if we remain faithful to God, when that day comes that we enter into heaven, the home of God, 
we will know joy that we have not known on the earth. The ultimate joy of the result of realizing that we as the children of God are now in the home of God and will be there into the ages of the ages. We will never know earthly life again. So we're here to adore God, to give high praise to God, to sing, to pray, <clears throat> and to hear the word from his book that can lead us along the right way. The lesson tonight is things Jesus taught that many people hate. Let's think about that again. <clears throat> things that Jesus taught that many people hate. Not everyone believes what Jesus taught. Not everyone believes what the sacred scriptures teach us. What we read within the holy writings. There are many people who really care less about what God's word says. They care less about what Jesus taught because human tradition, human opinion, man-made doctrine, satisfying mom, dad, brother, sister, neighbors, is what is foremost in the minds of many people. I've been through the same thing from relatives. When I know that they are wrong and I tell them that they are wrong, and they need to stop being wrong and get out of that man-made religion and come to the knowledge of salvation in Christ. One of the first things I hear is, that's your opinion. But it's not. It's what the Word of God teaches. And I'll get to that shortly. We have to give priority to the sacred writings. It has to be that way because God did not give us any other directions from earth to glory, from life to death, except what we read in the sacred scriptures. So, I would like to lay a, a foundation of, to show the need of hearing and accepting what Jesus taught instead of rejecting what he taught because when it's rejected, there will not be any fun. John 12, 48 through 50. <clears throat> this is what we read. John 12, 48 through 50. The Lord said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him on the last day. For I did not speak from myself, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment. What to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. So what Jesus spoke, what Jesus taught, came from the Father. And when the Son came to the earth and began teaching and proclaiming and speaking words, they were the very words that came from the Father. He said, I did not speak from myself, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. But before he said that, in verse 48 he stated, the one who rejects me. The one who rejects me. 
and does not receive my words, has one that will judge him. The word that I have spoken, the same will judge him on the last day. What is this really saying? What it's saying is that what Jesus taught, what Jesus spoke, was the very will and word of God, and on the day of judgment, what he said, what he spoke, what he taught, those words will judge us on that day. The very words will judge us on that day. But there are things that Jesus taught. There are things that Jesus spoke. There are words that Jesus spoke as he received them from the Father that many people hate. One such statement, one such group of words that many people hate is what the Lord said about loving him. The Lord said, we must love Jesus more than we love family, friend, or foe. <laughs> and I've heard people say, no, I, I, I just cannot love Jesus like that because I love mama. My mother gave birth to me. My mother nurtured me in her womb. So what mama says is what I will take above everything that everyone else says. Or daddy. Daddy provided a home. He got food for us. He protected us. So I put what daddy says above everything else, or siblings. We were born and raised in the same house. We had the same mother and father. So my siblings, my brothers and sisters, I must elevate them above and beyond everyone else and everything else. Well, there's a dead cat on the line when people say those things. And that cat is dusty, that cat is dry, and it's time to skin the cat now. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39, listen to what Jesus said. That these are the very words of Christ that he received from the Father. And these are some of the words that will stand in judgment regarding people on the last day. That's what he said. The one who rejects me. They may push Jesus to the side and does not receive my words. Has one that will judge him. The word that I have spoken the same will judge him on the last day. Listen to what Jesus says. Matthew 10, 34 and following. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. All right, look at it. Watch it. Here's what he says. He says, I did not come to bring peace on the earth. That's what he said. Not everything is la -di da Not everything is sweeter than honey that the Lord spoke. He said, I did not come to bring peace. What is he saying? I came to preach, proclaim, and bring the will of my Father, and there are so many people who just won't listen to it. Therefore, he says, I did not come to bring peace by proclaiming my Father's word. I came to bring a sword. A sword will cut. It will divide. And the Lord is now going to go into detail and show that the words that he came and proclaimed will divide families. They will divide communities because some in the family won't listen to what he said. There will be a few 
who will take his word above others. Therefore, he said, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. I came to bring my father's will. I came to preach my father's word. I came to teach words that give eternal life. But to many, that will be deemed to be a sword because it will be a time of separating those in families, in communities, in homes, because there will always be some that will not do or listen to what the Lord said. So he continues. For I came, verse 35 of Matthew 10, for I came to set a man against his father. He goes on. And a daughter against her mother. He continues. And a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Who came with a word that would divide families? Jesus. Who came with a message that would divide a daughter-in-law from or against the mother-in-law? The words of Christ. Because not all mother-in-laws will listen to what the Bible says. Not all Fathers will listen to what the Bible says. But he said, I came to set a man against his father. There are sons who will choose Jesus over father. And when that is done, a division occurs. Because if father chooses not to follow what Jesus said, and the son chooses to do what Jesus said, to listen to what Jesus said, the Lord said, now they are against one another. Because one chose my way, and the other chose to reject my word. This is powerful wording that Jesus speaks. And this shows us why. There are many people who hate these words that Jesus spoke. I know some, I personally know some people who were so wedded to mother, so wedded to father, so wedded to mother-in-law, so wedded to father-in-law, so wedded to husband, so wedded to wife that they will choose those people above and beyond the sacred scriptures and the voice of the Lord. So the Lord continues now in verse 36. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. Now Ron Daly is not the author of those words. King Jesus said it. And his words came from the Father. He came to bring the Father's commands, the Father's word, so he could redeem. But more will be hell-bound instead of heaven-bound because more people will choose to take another route than to take what the book says. They just don't know the horror that is awaiting them on the last day when they are raised from the dead and when they finally come to the full knowledge of their wrong choices they made and they're going to regret it forever and ever and ever. So the Lord goes on to say, verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Do we see the force of that language? The force of that language is if we love the members of our household, if we love the members of our family more than we love Jesus, he said, you're not worthy of me. Now that is called blunt, straightforward, factual teaching that Jesus taught when he spoke those words. Anyone that we love more than Jesus puts us in a position of not being worthy of him. Mm. He goes on. And he who does not take up his own cross 
and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. He who has lost his life for my sake will find it. You know what that's saying? When we think we're getting by with rejecting Jesus and rejecting his word, we think we have saved our existence, our lives. He said, nope, you've lost it. But when we give up everything that must be given up and we give our lives, lose our lives for the cause of Christ, in reality, we have found our lives. That is what he says. So that is something that Jesus taught that many people hate. They just don't want to think that Jesus and his word or words must have absolute priority over and above all else. And there are parents who will take their children and their children's lives and words over the word of Christ. But oh, what they will confront on the day of judgment when they stand before the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And when they are told, get away from me, I never knew you. Can you imagine how glorious, how brilliant that is going to be to see the king of kings and the Lord of lords on that day? Mm. And then to see the masses walk away. They're sent away from him because they chose another way other than him. So this is one of the things that Jesus taught that many people hate. They hate it. And the Lord said that you have to put me above your family. You have to love me more than you love mother, father, sister, brother, son, daughter. You must love me first, foremost. No exceptions. Me, the Lord, the Lamb of God, the Savior, the Redeemer. He said, you must love me more than you do them. If you love them more than me, you are not worthy of me. Number two, another thing that Jesus taught that many people hate is the fact that our precious Lord and Redeemer and the judge of the earth taught that same-sex marriages, homosexuality, and lesbianism are in defiance of God that God never determined, never decreed, never sanctioned, never authorized a man to have sexual relations with another male, male on male. Nope, not God's way. Woman with woman in a marriage relationship or a courting relationship. No, that is not what God decreed. And now we live in a time when you have men transitioning into becoming women. That's what they call it, transitioning. They start to dress like women. They want to try to speak like women, walk like women. Then you have women that are transitioning to become more masculine. They want to look like men, think like men, walk like men, talk like men, be like men. And they're using their own twisted minds to enter into a relationship that Yahweh, the God of eternity, has declared to be vile, reprobate, sinful, and it will have eternal consequences in fire, not in glory. Now this is what the Lord said. Let's hear it. In Matthew chapter 19, in verses 4 and 5, our master had this to say. He's responding to the Pharisees who ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Verse 3. Now in verse 4, listen to the words of Christ. And he answered and said, have you not read 
that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now these are the words of Christ. Christ taught that God, God made them in the beginning male and female. And we go to Genesis 2 where Moses was writing this uh, historical fact regarding the creation and the uh, making of the man and forming the woman from the rib taken from his side. And God's word is so clear, so emphatic, that God didn't make Adam and Steve and declare that they could be one flesh, but he made Adam and Eve and they would be one flesh. And in this day and time, virtually every day, we can just look out at the streets or in the communities and see two women, two females walking down the street, holding hands, kissing one another in a condition or a state of lesbianism. Or we can look out. It's becoming popular now, no longer in the closet, but it was wrong even in the closet. <laughs> but now it's not in the closet. It's wide open. And the leaders of this country in our day and time, and the leader in the mid or early 2000s, into the mid 2000s, gave his public endorsement of same-sex marriages and relationships, a president. And I remember looking at him make the statement, and I turned seven shades of white, wondering why he did it. I went through, like, why did he say that? Why would Obama do that? Why is Biden promoting this liberalistic political perspective instead of being a firm, sound, conservative, Bible-believing leader of a nation. He cares less about the Bible. When have you ever heard him quote a passage from the Bible and live what he quoted? <laughs> Rarely ever do we hear in the political atmosphere, rarely ever to hear a president quote from the Bible and then make the application that God's word makes toward wrongdoing. Most of them are so determined to get as many votes as they can, to be as popular as they can, that the last thing they will do is quote God's word. Well, I don't care how much money a president has, I don't care how popular he has become, or how historically significant he has become in American history, Judgment Day is going to trump all of that. Right. On Judgment Day, it won't matter if the president was black, white, a multimillionaire, or a poverty-stricken leader. On Judgment Day, what presidents and judges and sometimes governors and mayors neglect will meet them on that last day because the Lord said, the one who does not receive my word, the same will judge him on the last day. Jesus said that God made man and woman, male and female. He took Eve to Adam. And Adam recognized that God didn't take a man to him and say, now you all have each other. Because Adam became the father of children. 
through a woman, a female, a wife. It's just a sickening condition that this country is in. And some of God's own people just don't have the guts to declare what God says and to say it's sinful for this thing to go on. Because there are just some issues that God's own people, not all, but some of God's own people want to weasel their way out of responding to what we're seeing instead of crying against sin and trying to teach people how to get their souls right with God. And when we start to compromise issues like homosexuality, lesbianism, and same-sex marriages and so forth, we're also defying God. Because God did not justify. God did not authorize men to have sexual relations with men. Romans 1, <clears throat> 26 and 7 clearly says that women violated the very purpose that they were made. Women turned away from the natural and sought and participated in the unnatural relationships. And when they did it, they were decreed to be guilty of abominable acts and degrading acts. And so did the men. God's word is emphatically clear. Romans 1, 26 and 7. For this reason, God gave them over to dishonorable passions. For their females exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Any deviation from male and female, female and male, is unnatural. But that's not all. He goes on to say, And the same way also the males abandon the natural function of the female, and they burned in their desire toward one another, males with males, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. That's what God's word says, that women thwarted the plan and yielded towards other women or even beasts of the field. And men also abandoned the natural use and relationship and function with the female and men burned in their desire toward one another. And this is what I must say now. They burned in their desire for one another, but a burning is going to come that will outburn the burning they had for each other. The day and the time in which we live. Jesus taught against homosexuality, lesbianism, etc., because the Lord said that God, in the beginning, made male and female. And the two became one. It is never a fact that in the eyes of the God of heaven, that a woman with a woman in the marital relationship, or that a man with a man in a marital relationship, or that in a same-sex, sexual relationship, relationship. It is never a case that God binds them together and declares that they are one. It is the devil who has warped the minds of people that make them think that it's all right when a man has a man or a woman has a woman. The devil enables people to practice what I call Burger King religion. Have it your way. <laughs> That's what the devil does. He has an ability to swindle people, starting with their minds and their thinking and convincing people that what God says is wrong and it's going to be a penalty meted out to it. 
but the devil can make a person think differing with God is okay. What did he do to Eve and Adam in the garden? Remember that? Yahweh had told Adam, you may eat of every fruit of the trees in the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat of it, don't touch it, lest you die. When the serpent came to Eve, that slippery and slimy snake, he proposed to her to do the opposite to what God said. And Eve told him, we can't. God said we'll die. You know what Satan through the serpent did? You will not surely die. God knows that you will be like God knowing good and evil. And guess what Eve did? Crunch. <laughs> then she gave some to her honey bunch, to, to Adam. He ate too. And when they did, the darkness that they had never known came over their souls. Mm. And the point is, Satan has the same ability now as he did then in that he can entice people he can lure people into changing into disobedience in defying God but the results will be the same and finally with this point Paul wrote to the Corinthian congregation and he said in 1 Corinthians 6 9 and 10 that the unrighteous will not will not the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, who are the unrighteous? Among the list that he gave are the effeminate and the homosexuals. The effeminate refers to the man who takes on the woman's role and he allows another man to use his body, to misuse his body sexually and to have that relationship with him. That's the effeminate. A womanish kind of man. The homosexual is the one who becomes the power, who dominates and takes another man, and he participates in something that is wrong, wrong, wrong. But Paul makes clear that those who do such things will not, will not, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. What does that mean? That homosexuals, lesbians, and those who change, pervert, or twist what God said with regard to the relationships of the marriage bond, if they continue in that, they will not inherit heaven. They will be hell bound. They will lose their souls. That's what Paul teaches. Another thing that Jesus taught that people hate is that one needs to be, must be immersed in order to be saved. In Mark 16 <clears throat> and verse 16, in verse 15, Jesus told the apostles, go into all the world and proclaim the good news or proclaim the gospel to all the world. The one who believes and is immersed will be saved. But the one who does not believe will be condemned. That's what he said. The one, the person who believes and is. Look at what he says now. The one who believes and is immersed will be saved. But the one who doesn't believe, the one who rejects it, will be condemned. One of the most amazing things that I have ever read is from the Baptist Manual. And on my father's side of the family, it's it, largely Baptist. On my mother's side, was largely Methodist. 
And I have no doubt whatsoever that we live in a day and a time that we need to get the attention of people that we want to save by means of God's word. And to do that, we can't beat around the stump. We cannot duck and dodge against saying what needs to be said. The Lord didn't compromise with the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. He named them. <laughs> he said to the Pharisees. He said to the scribes. He said to the Sadducees. Read Matthew 23 when you get the chance. You talk about strong, hair-burning, and skin-singing words. He gave it. But this is what the Baptist Manual says on page 20. And it's, this is listed under note number 8. It says, Baptism is not essential to salvation. For our churches utterly repudiate the dogma of baptismal regeneration. But it is essential to obedience since Christ has commanded it. Now there are two hypocritical statements in this paragraph. All right, but let's go back to the first one. The Baptist manual, and I have never met a Baptist preacher who said anything differently to what this manual says. It's the Hiscock Standard Manual for Baptist churches. And it says, baptism is not essential to salvation. It says baptism is not, is not. The Baptist manual says that baptism is not essential to salvation. But Jesus said, the one who believes and is immersed will be saved. And in 1 Peter 3.21, Peter said, Immersion does also now save us. But the Baptist manual says it does not save us. There's a dead cat on this line. The Bible says immersion does, does, does also, does also now, does also now save, does also now save us, not putting away bodily filth, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter said immersion does, does, does also now save. The Baptist manual says it does not. Does this sound familiar to anyone? What did the devil tell Eve? You will not, 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 not. You will not surely die. And the Baptist preachers are no better than the devil. They're saying the same thing with the same word that the devil used. He told Eve, you will not surely die. And the Baptist manual says, Baptism does not save. It is not essential. But the Bible says immersion does. D-O-E-S. And the Bible doesn't say that baptism or immersion does not save. That's what the Baptist manual says. The Bible says immersion does also now save us. And we can see since the Bible says one thing, since Jesus said, the one who believes and is immersed will be saved, then what we have is the Baptist manual is defying the words of Christ. And it shows that those in the Baptist church or the Methodist or the Presbyterian or the Lutheran or the Episcopal who deny the essentiality of immersion will one day face what they have denied that Jesus spoke. What did John 12, 48 say again? The one who rejects me and does not receive my word has one that will judge him. The word that I have spoken, the same, the same, will judge him on the last day. Now, there's something else wrong with this paragraph in the Baptist manual. It says, baptism is not essential to salvation. For our churches utterly repudiate the dogma of baptismal regeneration. But, but 
it, that is, baptism is essential to obedience. Now, this cat is starting to stink now. If something is essential to obedience, does that not mean that saying something is essential to salvation? Listen to what Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 says. Though he was, he, contextually, the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who owe Obey him. What does that tell us? That obedience is necessary for eternal salvation. But the Baptist manual says that baptism is not essential to salvation, but it is essential to obedience. But obedience is essential to salvation. The book says in Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 that though he, Jesus, was the son, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation. To whom? To those who obey him. Those who, who choose not to obey him and who reject immersion, they will be lost according to God's word. Because if you don't obey, you cannot and will not be saved. Because he, our Lord, is the source of eternal salvation to all, all who obey him. And it shows a contradiction that the Baptist manual in one sentence would say, Baptism is not essential to salvation, but then in the next clause it would say, but it is essential to obedience. But according to the Bible, obedience is an element of salvation. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9, and so many other scriptures as well. It's really sad that some of, our, of the preachers within the Lord's family, the Lord's congregations, have lost the power, have lost the enthusiasm that we used to have a generation or two ago to stand up in the pulpits and send out a strong message that opposes all denominationalism, all human religions, but how often do we hear it? Even in our area, when we look at the guys who preach on YouTube for the large affluent congregations in the city and thereabout. It's amazing that the younger generation of preachers, not every single one, but so many of them, just don't have the same fire and power and straightforward approach that preachers of yesteryear used to have. Much of the preaching that we hear today is what I call sugar-coated preaching. And it's so sweet, it will make, it's so sweet that it's sweeter than honey and would make a bee puke by eating it. It's just that way. What is wrong with us? Why can we not stand and sacrifice our health, our lives, even our means of living, if necessary, to stand up for what God's word teaches, regardless of the consequences in this world. It is just sad, so sad. And there are elders in some places that young preachers listen to when the elders say, now don't, get, don't come down so hard on denominations 
As a matter of fact, don't you name those denominations from the pulpit. You stay clear of it. Now, we'll give you more than enough support financially. We'll support your reputation. And we'll have a growing congregation. But leave denominations alone. Leave false doctrine alone. Leave alone the prominent men of today. Billy Graham, Ernest Angley, Earl Roberts. Don't name those guys. Something's bad wrong. It's sickening. The apostles of Christ, and we'll get to this the last night of the meeting, they didn't go around biting their fingernails and then pulling up their feet and by biting their toenails because they were afraid. No, sir, they gave their lives for the Lord. Paul would write and say, the time of my departure has come. I'm being poured out like a drink offering. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. Therefore, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to all those who have loved his appearance. Paul was a fighter. But there are some others that we will talk about briefly on Wednesday night that wouldn't be allowed to preach in many places today. Because what they preached then is not what many congregations want to hear today. But one thing that so many are forgetting on Judgment Day, it's going to be a payday. And what is meted out will not be readily received. Hmm. On that great day of judgment, it's not going to be like a barbecue feast. It's going to be fire and there's going to be smoke. But it's not going to be like a big barbecue where everybody's invited to come to it. It's going to be what the Bible calls a lake of fire, a place of punishment. Because God was rejected. His son was rejected. The spirit's truth was rejected. And we chose to make people happy. We chose to have congregations with multi-million dollar buildings and audiences of three, four, five hundred or a thousand. And there are some congregations among God's people that focus more on how many we can bring in to have a large collection to be known as a large, prominent congregation. But where do we read about that in the New Covenant? A congregation of ten or five that preaches the truth, that lives the truth, and defends the truth in the eyes of Yahweh, the eternal God, stands as a prominent congregation beyond those of several hundred or a thousand or so. It has to be God's way. Jesus also taught, in, in, in conclusion, that most religious people will be lost. Now, you talk about putting the rubber down on the asphalt, rubber on the road. It's meeting the road now. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. Many who go through what, dear Lord? Many who enter the wide gate. Many who enter the broad way that leads to destruction. Do we see the word many? He said many will take that road to destruction. Then he says, for the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life. And there are few who find it. There is a distinct difference between few and many. The Lord said many will go the broad way, the road that leads to destruction. And few will take that narrow, constricted way. Why, Lord? Because most people, and this is a fact, most people are going to participate in and die in have it your way religion. No matter what the Bible says, there really are people who could care less. But look at what's coming. Many will choose the road to destruction and few the narrow way. No wonder Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven 
They say, Lord, Lord. He says, they will say, Lord, Lord, but many will say, Lord, Lord, but they will not enter into the kingdom of heaven just by saying that. Well, who will enter, Lord? The one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, those who say, Lord, Lord, are religious people. How do we know it? He continues. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many mighty works in your name? They were religious people. But listen to what he will say to them. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. But they were religious. But he says, I never knew, I never sanctioned you. I was never in fellowship with you. But they're fighting for their eternal souls. Did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? But to those very same religious people, he is going to say, get away, go from me, you workers of iniquity. People, many people hate what the Lord said in that passage. Now is an opportunity for those who are not Christians, who have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, who are not saved, Believe that Jesus is God's son. You have to. John 8, 24, the Lord told the Jews, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. And then you have to openly acknowledge. After you have a change of mind and repent, you must acknowledge that you believe Jesus Christ is God's son. And then you must be immersed in water in order to be saved. And I would like to advise out of deep, deep love and compassion. Don't wait to do what needs to be done tonight. Change it while you have the opportunity. Do it. Do it God's way. Don't wait. Don't delay. Come now and come today as we stand in sin.